the feeling like there's something wrong will continue the stress response and make the stress chronic. And then the fact of chronic stress will keep the pain going through its impact on the thyroid and the thymus and all the things that we've just been talking about, right? So it's this vicious circle again, this feedback loop where a feeling that something is wrong because I'm in pain in keeps that chronic stress going. And then that chronic stress going keeps the chronic pain going. Hi, welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson. And today we are talking chronic pain, what causes it and what to do about it. So Elwin, tell me, why did you choose this topic today about chronic pain? Well, this is a topic very close to my heart, Chrissy. Um, it's something that I've suffered with uh, on and off for mm, seven or eight years now, and especially up until recently, the last three years. It's, I've had a real struggle with it and a real journey. And I would say I was blessed to have a type of uh, pain issue that was particularly difficult to resolve. And I say blessed because it meant that along the way, I discovered loads of things that are actually highly effective for most people, <laughs> including people around me. Um, and so I had to go kind of all the way before I found out what was actually uh, necessary for me. But yeah, so this is definitely for those people um, who feel like they've tried everything, let's just say. None of us can really have tried everything. It's a common thing to say, but, you know, there's more stuff out there than any of us could ever try in a lifetime. But for those who already feel like they tried everything, uh, this, that's what, that's who this episode is for. So because, and the reason I prioritized it is because pain is debilitating, right? It takes over your life. It, it really ruins your quality of life. It makes it very difficult to, um, think about anything other than the pain. Uh, if it's bad and even if it's not there, even if it's intermittent, even if it's not horrifically painful, it's kind of like a constant thing of, oh, I'm afraid to do this. I don't want to do this because, right? Like if you if you think, if you feel like your pain is caused by an injury, then, you know, you don't want to do anything strenuous or you don't want to do this because it might bring it back again. So pain, not only does it ruin the quality of your life the moment you have it, but I would also say it ruins the quality of your life all the rest of the time because you're like afraid of having it come back and you're afraid of making it worse. So this is a really big issue. Now, having said that, you know, we did, we talked about um, how to be the optimal weight uh, a few episodes ago. In the kind of like alternative health world, for want of a better word, the non mainstream health world, like how to lose weight is probably like the biggest demographic. And I would say it's because there's so many people who are struggling with it in this day and age. And there's not any good answers out there. Now, how, and, and there's also a lot of research on it for that reason. Now, how to not be in pain, in contrast, there's hardly any research into in comparison. And also, there's way less interest in it, um, I would say. There's way less clicks or whatever, just because people feel like they already have a solution, right? And that solution is painkillers. So, and it's the ditto of energy, you know, like a decade ago, because that was one of my big issues of, you know, having extreme fatigue and exhaustion. I, I wanted to teach about energy. But again, it was hard to find a, a big enough um audience for that that could really sustain a whole business because most people feel like if they're low in energy just drink a coffee right <laughs> yeah. if they're exhausted just just have a stimulant so it's one of those things and pain is a similar thing where it's like just take a painkiller but of course there's some issues with that so first of all for some people and again i'm very fortunate that the type of pain that i was suffering with was this type painkillers just don't work like for me they absolutely made no difference. I mean, they made me feel groggy and all the stuff that painkillers, you know, can do, but um, they did not actually <laughs> really uh, make a noticeable dent in the pain. So thank God for that. And when you're talking about painkillers, are you talking about over the counter? Are you talking something that your doctor prescribed for you? Can you clarify? Uh, yeah, both. I mean, um, you know, mainly over the counter, uh, but I mean, I've barely tried it. Like I'm not the kind of guy to use them anyway, but yeah, paracetamol, ibuprofen, co codeine. And then, uh, but also when I was in, um, uh, when I flew to Singapore, it was a 14 hour flight and it got really bad during that. When I landed there, I went to the emergency room there and they gave me tramadol, which I understand is a fairly strong opiate painkiller. And yeah, it just made no difference. Um, it had that opiate like effect where 
you don't care about anything as much. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, it, and I just, I threw it away. I just, I, I took it once and I, I threw it away. Like it was nothing. It was totally not worth the price. But as I say, I'm lucky in that regard, even though it may not feel that way at times, because of course, if painkillers do work for you, especially the opiate type, it's, it's really serious, right? So the non-opiate type, the NSAIDs, uh, like your ibuprofen and stuff, they have really you know, serious potential health costs um, in terms of the liver and the stomach and the digestive system. Um, and then the, uh, the opiate ones, of course, have a huge cost in terms of addiction, which we'll talk about later because endorphins are a key part of pain. I want to explain that fully and, and, and like a, a, a better solution for that. And of course, the other thing is that you know, the amount of people who are accidentally overdosing these days on opioids. Um, I, I think it's either the number three or four biggest cause of death these days is uh, accidental uh, death by poisoning. And some kind of medication drugs are in there, but I'm pretty sure the biggest category within that category is opioids, especially recently, especially in the US where you are, Chrissy, that's particularly prevalent. Um, so this is a really big deal. And often people get into the these things in the first place because they're in chronic pain right and then they end up you know overdosing on fentanyl or something like that it's it's terrible it, right and so yeah, it's pretty terrible i mean there was a real um and not a real what i mean is uh there was an something on, i don't know if it's netflix or something like that it was called dope sick and it was really all about the opioid epidemic that just completely opened my eyes to that and it was quite shocking actually yeah i think hulu um yeah yeah i'm familiar with that one yeah yeah, yeah it, um Absolutely. And that was, uh, I didn't watch it, but wasn't that about like the pharmaceutical industry yes. kind of pushing this to doctors and stuff like, yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. So we won't comment on that too much because we know that the place where all these videos are hosted are kind of friendly with the pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> in a, but I think that one you're allowed to talk about these days. But yeah, in a nutshell, um, it's part of that whole mentality that we touched a little bit upon on the peptides um, uh, episode as well, which is completely understandable, which is, I don't want your, you know, long-term resolving root issues stuff. I just want to not be in pain right now, right? And I feel a lot of compassion for this, partly because I've been through it, but mainly because especially if you're in pain, you don't want to hear about root causes. You don't want to hear about long-term plans. You just want to not be in pain. It's really simple and really obvious. But that's why I say kind of this episode is for people who've already tried all that stuff. Maybe you're like me and painkillers don't work for you. Maybe the cost of painkillers is now too high and you realize you've got to find a better way. Maybe you're on painkillers, but you want to find a better way. You're being proactive about it, which is wonderful if that's the case. Or maybe you're trying to help someone else who's struggling with this is, uh, with this issue, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, this is not for people who are perfectly happy with uh, just taking painkillers and ignoring the issue. This is, and of course, it's not always easy to find the root cause, and that's why we've got a whole big, long video about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, bar the um, the pain that we feel when we break a, a you know a bone or something like that, what is it? What, why do we actually feel pain? Well, I mean, the breaking the bone is a good example. So pain is a, or pain is meant to be a signal that something's wrong. And this is part of the problem with painkillers. Not always. there's there's uh, nuances to this, but this is potentially the problem with painkillers. So if you're in pain, it's a signal, it should be a signal that there is something wrong. So for instance, I broke my leg as the example that you just gave Chrissy. There is actually a very small percentage of people, I think it's less than one in a million, but they have a particular genetic anomaly. And because it's so rare, sorry, <laughs> we don't have a test for this in genetic insights, but you would know anyway if you had it, um, where they just don't feel pain. And those people who just are incapable of feeling pain, they tend to have loads of injuries, way more than people who do, and they also tend to die way younger than people who, uh, well, than everyone else, people who can feel pain. So not being able to feel pain, although it w sounds very tempting to those who have suffered or are suffering from chronic pain, it's not a great solution either. And so um, taking drugs to kind of temporarily, even if it's only partially and even if it's only for a few hours, put yourself in that state where you can't feel pain. It's not great either. It has similar drawbacks. It's because you're ignoring the problem. You're ignoring what is actually causing the issue. Now, having said that, there is that crucial distinction between acute and chronic pain. So acute pain is short-term pain. We already talked about the difference between acute stress and chronic stress. So 
let's use the broken leg example, Chrissy. Like if you have a really bad break, um, then that pain is there for a reason. It's giving you a message, right? Don't put your weight on me, you know, rest me, fix me, do something about this, right? And uh, it's, it's absolutely there for a purpose. Now, in some cases, people break their leg and then 10 years later, they still have pain when they walk. And so then it's a question of, is it still a signal telling you that there's something wrong that you need to do something about? Or has something gone wrong with the pain system itself? And that's what we're going to explore. And so that's more of the category of chronic pain. So I just want to make it really, really clear. If you're watching this video because you're in pain and this pain is in any way new, go to a doctor, right? This is one of the things that medical doctors are absolutely uh, perfectly competent and helpful and great at, right? If you've broken something, if you cracked something, if you've torn something, if you've burned something, if you cut something. And, you know, that's the physical causes. We'll go through some of the other things, right? Like an infection can absolutely cause pain. There's a bunch of different things that can cause pain. If it's acute, if it's new, if you haven't been to a doctor yet, turn this video off, go and do that. <laughs> so this is really for people who have had the same pain for a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean many months, usually years or decades, who've already been to a doctor, who've probably already been to a physiotherapist and chiropractor and all those other kind of people that you tend to go to first, osteopath, that when you have pain, been to a bunch of doctors, a bunch of specialists, none of them have been able to help or the help they've offered has only been pain relief or temp, you know, maybe you feel better for a day or two after the session, but then it comes right back again. That's who we're talking to really here. And that's what I mean by uh, uh, chronic pain. Well, which brings me to my next question, really, is, which is, what are the causes of chronic pain? <laughs> yeah, that's a question I've invested a lot of hours in, a lot of hours while in pain or a lot of hours while being afraid of being in pain again. Um, and it's a really good question. And I was surprised about the lack of clarity on that subject, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, do this, do that, go see this person, go see that person. But I did not see a huge amount of information about what actually causes it. And I want to be more specific here. So we talked about, and I'll address this more fully later, but just as an example. So we talked about uh, a broken leg, right? So here's the thing. If you have a snapped leg bone, right? You have an x-ray and the bone that should be one piece is in two pieces. What percentage of people in that situation feel pain? I would say 100%. <laughs> yeah, or 99.99999, right? Yeah, Everyone except one. for those yes. extreme outliers, right? So that's clear. And so to me, then, that's clear that that is the cause of the pain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because people who have that always have pain, pretty much. Now, when we're talking about things like slip discs or pinch nerves and stuff like that, things that can be seen with an X-ray or an ultrasound or a CT or something like that, a lot of the time, that is blamed on the pain. But then if you ask the question, well, are, are there some people who have that exact same situation and who don't have pain? The answer is yes. And ditto for other areas of the body, right? Like inflamed gums. There'll be some people that that's agonizingly painful for. Some people it looks exactly the same on an x-ray or based on you know a dentist or hygienist doing an examination, and yet they're not in pain. So that tells me, so if, a, if only say 50 or even 80% of people who, who have a problem feel pain, that tells me it's not a cause, but it's a contributing factor. Does that make sense? And so, you know, I always start with medical professionals. And so when I've asked medical professionals, okay, so why is that? Why is it that um, this is causing pain for me, but it doesn't for someone else? The answer they usually give you, and I'm not dismissing this answer, this is the one we're going to go in depth on uh, in the first half of this video, is inflammation, right? So you have an inflammatory response, Owen, or you have an inflammatory response uh, viewer or listener to this particular situation, to this slip disc, to this inflamed gum, to this whatever. You're having an inflammatory response, and so therefore you're in pain, and this person over there, um, for whatever reason, they're having... Maybe they're still having an inflammatory response, but they're having less of an inflammatory response. And for whatever reason, they don't feel pain. And if you go, okay, well, why does that cause pain for me? That's usually the follow-up question, if you're persistent and curious like me. And then usually the answer they'll give, in my experience, is either I don't know, I don't care, or it's genetic. <laughs> now, 
I'm not dismissing the genetic thing, right? In fact, I've got a whole business based around that. Do genetic factors make a difference as to um, whether you have all these kind of issues? Absolutely. The accuracy of these genetic reports we do is astounding. It's definitely a factor. It's definitely significant. But again, it's not the only thing, right? It's, it's, it's significant, and we'll talk about it, but it's not the only thing. So back to the answer that they all give, right? It's inflammation. It's because you have inflammation or you have more inflammation or you have a certain kind of inflammation and so therefore you're in pain. But what is inflammation? And for those of you who've seen my other videos, you probably know I always harp on about this, but inflammation is not just a thing that happens. Inflammation is a immune response. So inflammation is your immune system doing something to your body, an area of your body, tissues of your body, cells of your body, whatever. Why is it doing that thing? Um, as we talked about uh, actually in the last episode, in the peptides episode, it's uh, called generally the innate immune response. It's like a first line defense. When you first stub your toe, when you first burn yourself, when you first break a leg, when you first um, get some kind of significant amount of pathogenic organisms go inside you, when you first have any invader go inside you, even if it's a knife going into you or a, or a fawn or whatever, your immune system response, uh, you know, a stinger from a, a bee stings you, whatever, your immune system responds and it responds with inflammation. And so this is a generalized protective healing mechanism. But the problem is it's only supposed to be a first line of response. In most cases, it should be dealt with in a few days. In the case of pathogenic organism, it should have largely gone away within one to two weeks. And the longest that that inflammatory response should really be there if there's a really you know, proper break of a really big bone, should be a few months. And, and yet some of us have uh, this inflammatory response cre creating chronic pain, or so we're told that that's the cause, going on for years, decades, even more than half a lifetime, right? And so what's going on where the immune system seems to still be acting like it's a new emergency years or decades later? Really, really good. And I'm really, really excited to get deeper into this because, you know, like you said, this is a million dollar question, what's really causing all this? Because there's so many people that are actually, you know, really suffering and it is debilitating, properly debilitating. And it not only, you know, that you're feeling that physical pain, but then also what it does to you mentally. And so I just, you were talking about the immune system and the innate response. What, what kind of immune response would lead to chronic pain? So that is, again, the billion dollar question, I guess. And so that's what we're going to get into. Um, so I want to like put a few um, other examples of things that are possible first. So I mentioned the gum example, right? So one of the answers could be a chronic infection, right? So in the case of, uh, if you have, I think it's the stat is something like 97, 98% of people have a chronic infection in their mouth, usually in their gums. So now again, not, 97% of people have pain, right? So there's still that distinction, but it's certainly a contributing factor, right? That if you have a chronic infection in your gums, then you're going to have some degree of chronic immune response. And it does seem to be, if we ask the question, why do some people have a more exaggerated immune response, then genetics is certainly a factor. So the mainstream medical establishment are right about that. But there are, are other ones which we'll go into. But that's definitely a significant factor. And this is not just in your mouth. So we tend to have chronic infections in every, or we tend to have the possibility of having chronic infections. And many people do have chronic infections way more than they often realize in all the areas that are technically outside the body. So the skin is technically outside the body. Uh, fungal infections on the skin is very common. There is kind of some belief that things like eczema and stuff like that actually has an infectious component to it, although that's not a certain, not as proven, also can be autoimmune, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, but then there's the sinuses. So the sinuses are technically, technically outside the body. Uh, the, the lungs, in fact, as well. So the whole respiratory you know, system where the air goes in and out is technically outside the body. Um, the urethra up to a certain point is technically outside the body. Um, and the whole digestive tract is technically outside the body. And so all of these are area, uh, and the ears as well, again, up until a certain point. Um, I think I missed any out, I think that's it. Oh, and then for women, the uh, vagina, right? So for 
all of these areas that are technically outside the body, what does it mean to be technically outside the body? It means that it's outside the body as far as your immune system is concerned. So your immune system polices this barrier very fiercely between what is inside and outside the body. So as soon as it kind of pierces the skin, as soon as it gets to have a possibility of getting into the bloodstream, that's inside the body. But technically the whole digestive tract is like a tube that even though it's inside your body, it's technically treated as outside of the body, which is why all, as long as you don't have an issue of your immune system, you could have all kinds of foods going through there, all kinds of um, organisms go through there, and in fact live in there, that if they were inside your body, if they were inside your bloodstream, your immune system would immediately go into an emergency panic response. So you know they talk about the good bacteria in your body? All the good bacteria in your body, as far as mainstream science is concerned, is actually technically outside your body. All those good bacteria in your gut, if they actually accidentally leak into your bloodstream, then your immune system is immediately going to treat them as a foreign invader. All right. So all of this stuff is technically uh, outside your body. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes absolute sense. It, and it, I think as well, the way you were describing it inside, outside, you know, that, that makes things a lot clearer because as well, good bacteria, things like that, people are like, well, which one's good, which one's bad. But essentially, you know, we don't, well, what's new to me is that, yeah, there, we actually have a lot of everything. It's just when it proliferates in a, in a, um, you know, in a way that then can bring more attention to it or it's out of balance. But uh, yeah, that's a really good distinction. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So our balance, as we said, like we're discovering that most of the bacteria should actually be in the large intestine, not the small intestine. So that's kind of details. But the point is, it's all bad as soon as it gets into the actual body, right? The, the, again, there's some debate about this in the fringes now, but the basic mainstream understanding is the blood is sterile, right? Nothing should be getting inside the body. And as soon as it does, the immune system's all over it. That's the, uh, that's the uh, mainstream view. So chronic infections. So that could be an explanation for chronic pain, right? So for instance, if you're always having pain in your sinuses, maybe it's because you're always having an infection in your sinus to some degree, right? Like a low level infection. So that's one potential answer. Um, so another potential answer is um, that it's a response to injury, right? And this is actually the most common thing that I hear. Oh, you know, I twisted my ankle, you know, I tore my ACL, I slipped my disc, I pulled my this, and now 10 years later, it still hurts, right? I'm more skeptical about this for the reasons that I just talked about, because you know an inflammatory response, again, unless it is an ongoing issue, like an ongoing infection, a chronic infection, inflammatory response should not be ongoing. It should only be for a period of time and then the immune system calms down. Now, of course, some theorize that, okay, but the immune system's going wrong, that's why you're getting chronic pain, but I'm a bit suspicious about this. So we're, we're gonna talk about the different um, uh, inputs on that. And then, yeah, the other theory about it is that, is that it is a type of autoimmunity. And of course, sometimes this is absolutely correct. So the most famous one, when it, I mean, all autoimmune conditions, I believe, cause significant pain. But the most famous and probably common one is arthritis, right? Where you get pain in your joints, rheumatoid arthritis. So that's an autoimmune condition. That is where your immune system, for whatever reason, is attacking your joints, tendons, ligaments, and all the rest of it, and inflaming them and causing chronic and constant pain. Yeah, I think that's also, for me, tends to be a place when people just say, oh, it's autoimmune, it's autoimmune. I'm like, yeah, but why is it autoimmune? What happened? What's going on? What's, you know, can you explain a little bit more about that? And, you know, just in a little bit greater detail for Absolutely. For and I just want to say, like, I, when I use the word aut uh, term autoimmune, I use the category a little bit more broad than the strict medical view. To me, autoimmune is just any time when your immune system is attacking your own tissues. And, you know, like, for instance, I had gum disease. So I went to see a doctor, uh, sorry, a dentist a few years ago, and they're like, you have gum disease. And and um, and then it turned out, like, uh, someone else who'd been with me the same day, they also had um, inflamed gums. So both of us had a situation where the immune system was attacking uh, something, but the difference is... Uh, we both had gum infection, which again, as I said, the vast majority of people do. But the difference is their immune system was just inflaming the gums. Whereas with mine, my immune system was overreacting so much, it was wearing down the bone that holds the tooth in place. And so therefore the gum is receding more and more and becoming more and more inflamed. And the more it recedes, the more that stuff can get stuck in there and be even more inflammation and more infection. And it's like a whole vicious cycle thing. But the point is, you know, my immune system reacted by, you know, wearing away my um, 
uh, bone to the point like my teeth would eventually fall out. Whereas that other person, even though they had exactly the same situation of the chronic infection, that wasn't happening for them at all. And again, when I asked, well, why is that, right? Why are why with exactly the same situation are our bodies responding in such different ways? The answer I got was uh, genetic, <laughs> um, which again, may be a factor, right? We have a gum disease uh, report, I think, in Genetic Insights. And it, it's, uh, yeah, there's a, it's a factor, but there's a lot more to it. So yeah, let's get into all the different things that I've discovered. Yeah, perfect. Um, I was going to say, yeah, because you know, it's, it's one of those <laughs> things where it's like, well, why is the body doing that? And why is it going, you know, it's a great example with the gums, but you know, I'm sure that there is more. So please list away. Yes. Let's go through it. And in fact, uh, you know, in terms of genetic reports, I'll just say we have a chronic pain report and we have reports on like over a dozen common different um, pain conditions. I think it might be even almost 20. So to say whether you have a tendency towards that. And that's helpful to know. Now, what isn't clear of those genetic reports, often all we're able to give you is correlation or causation. Meaning we can tell you based on your genetics and based on you know uh, surveys of you know, a hell of a lot of other people with similar genetics, we've noticed a lot of people with these genetics have this issue. We're not always sure why. I think we talked about this before in digestion, like with some things like irritable bowel syndrome, they're not even sure what causes that, but they know person with this genetic typing, these specific SNPs have a, you know, a high or a low chance of having this issue. So we can often be very accurate at predicting your chance of having a condition, including a pain condition, without still actually understanding what causes the pain condition in the first place. So we're really only seeing the correlation. But it's still helpful to see that because it means you can go, oh, okay, you know, this is just, everyone has some problem with their genetics, right? And for those people who never seem to have pain, never have health issues, I would say, look at their mental health, look at their emotional health. Usually it shows up for them more in the brain. Like maybe they have obsessive compulsive, maybe they have addictions, maybe there's something. So it's very rare that we have no issues, basically is what I'm saying. Everyone has them somewhere. So you can go, okay, so mine are, here, right? I already said one for me, gum disease. Okay, that's just one of the things that will tend to happen to me if I don't look after myself well enough. That's where my problems will tend to show up. And by the way, that is something that's really easy to deal with, gum disease. We'll maybe do an episode on that. I don't know if it's a whole episode, but maybe dental health or something because it is actually pretty easy to resolve. Anyway, let's talk about pain. So one of the things that absolutely can set your immune system off to be attacking your own tissues is toxicity. Now, this is something that is recognized even in mainstream science. It tends to be ignored. It tends to not be looked for. But if you said um, to you know, a mainstream doctor, is it possible, like I did, is it possible that the very high levels of lead in my blood could be causing this immune system uh, reactivity and pain? They'll go, well, the response I got was, yeah, could be. And I was like, okay, do you wanna, can you find out? Um, if that's the case, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, okay. That's, uh, that's typical. I, you know, I don't know about the healthcare, about where you are, Chrissy, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of typical of the experience that I've had anyway, a lack of interest in, uh, dealing with anything other than emergency. Well, but I, anyway. I also do find it's like when they don't have the answer, like that's very, what do you say? I don't have the answer. I don't know what to tell you, you know, because I think there's a lot of times where that, that is the case or, or like you just said, they're like, yeah, no, can't help you. Okay. Next. <laughs> At least it was an honest answer, right? Yeah. Rather than dismissing me, <laughs> yes. which, you know, I know a lot of people have to deal with as well. Um, but yeah, it's not really helpful, right? There was no interest in finding out the, uh, what was actually going on, but whatever. So I'm saying even in mainstream medicine, toxins, uh, it will be emitted sometimes can cause all of these problems, all of this situation. For all I know, the toxins that I have that's demonstrated to be proved or and all the rest of it was the cause all along. And it is true that as that has gone down, so has the issues that I had with pain. So it could be as simple as that. I don't think so, but that's possible. And so that's definitely something that's worth checking if you haven't checked that before, because that's one of those things, the weakest link in the chain thing, where you can do everything else, including all the stuff I'm gonna say later, which may sound profound to you, but it may not, but it may do, and you may embrace it. And yet still, if you've got loads of mercury in your system, or you've got loads of lead, or you've got loads of mycotoxins, or you've got loads of pesticides or something. And when I say loads, I mean, like, you know, high, like way, you know, significantly higher than most people, then that could well be the issue. But again, if unless it's loads, 
if it's too much, but an average level of too much, you have to look around and go, well, there are plenty of people who have similarly high levels who do not have chronic pain. So again, it might be a contributing factor, but it's not the cause for the same reason that we talked about earlier. Because if something's a cause, through my definition, it has to show up pretty much all the time as a consequence, right? For everyone. If you have a cause and the consequence only shows up half the time, then it's not a cause, it's a contributing factor. If that makes right, sense. And, and you mentioned, you know, your um, your journey with uh, lead. How would somebody look or be able to test to see if this was the case for them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's not easy. So with the different heavy metals, there's um, blood tests or urine tests. That's basically the ones that are reliable. Um, there are also ones where they kind of like take your hair. That can tell you something, but it, it basically tells you how much your body is excreting via your hair, which is kind of limited. A lot of people favor that test because it's cheaper. It's way cheaper. Um, but the other thing is that you could have fairly high levels of toxins in your hair, and it's because you're washing your hair every day with water that's high in toxins. doesn't necessarily mean that it's in your blood. And it's, it's what's in your blood and in your cells that really matters. So to get a really good answer, you're going to want to test your blood and possibly your urine as well. Some things show up better with blood. Something show up better with urine. I think in the US, the company I would probably use is either ZRT, ZRT for you Americans, um, or Genova Diagnostics. They both do uh, testing for this. Or, hey, some main, mainstream one as well. I think they're just uh, more expensive. But, um, you know, whatever your standards, uh, you know, there's two or three testing companies, I think, in the US that monopolize most of it. I believe that they'll test for it as well. But I think you got to pay for like one at a time. So if you want to test for everything, it gets quite expensive. Whereas with the companies I mentioned before, um, you can kind of test a full broad range and it's not too expensive, but it's still not cheap. But for me, the cost of whatever that was, a few hundred dollars was totally worth it because it suddenly put everything in context of why everything has been so difficult for me, basically. Not the only reason, but a significant contributing factor that made everything so difficult because lead basically... It's highly toxic. I won't do a full thing on lead. I want to do it soon, actually, uh, like a detox episode. But it basically, it's a rate limiting factor. It will stop everything else working properly. There are many things that can do that, but high levels of toxin are one of the things that can do that. So that's significant. You're going to want to look into that um, because that can absolutely be a major contributing factor. And you could look at it as cause in the sense that if you don't resolve it, nothing else will work. So in that sense, you could call it a cause. Um, Another toxin that's uh, potentially constantly high that relates to chronic infection, um, and especially this is digestive system, is endotoxin. We talked about this before, I think, when it came to digestion. But if you have a lot of endotoxin and all the other toxins that um, different organisms... Can you quickly just define endotoxin for those here that may not have seen that one? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, also called LPS or lipopolysaccharide. It's basically a byproduct of not all, but a lot of organisms in the intestines, including even organisms that are considered to be neutral or not a problem. Like, you know, if you showed your doctor and go, I've got these organisms in my store, they'll go, so, you know, like that's nothing. But there is also plenty of research that will indicate that if you have a lot of those okay organisms creating a lot of endotoxin, that's still a significant load, a significant stress in the whole body. And yes, it can dysregulate the immune system, which you know can then have a knock-on effect, causing all kinds of health issues, including chronic pain. Um, and there's other ones. Endotoxin is just the most um, voluminous. It's the one that you tend to have the most of. And those different toxins create inflammation. Inflammation can create gas and acidity. And the acidity, if it wears away enough, it can cause ulcers and sores and stuff, and that can cause pain. And the gas, if there's enough of it, it can build up and create pressure, and that can create pain. So those are other ways that a toxin can uh, indirectly create pain. So those are kind of some of the maybe more well-known ones in the uh, maybe alternative community. But now I want to get into what I feel is quite not well-known or not thought about, but really significant. And it relates actually to the hormonal episode uh, in a way. So the list I've made is basically going through uh, each of the glands. I would say of the seven major glands, which corresponds to the seven chakras, if you want a mnemonic, you have to believe in chakras. Of the seven major glands, the only one that cannot, does not have a significant impact on pain is the pancreas and insulin production. I do not see a strong correlation there. There's a bit of a correlation, 
So the pancreas also creates sodium bicarb, which um, is a strong alkalizer that can get rid of excess acidity, which can also cause pain. But that's a bit more tenuous. It's not really accepted medically. So I'm just going to focus on the things that are like that there's really good science behind. So the first one that is really, really interesting is endorphins. Now, endorphins actually have a significant impact on pain in at least two ways, rather than only one, which was you know more obvious to me when I first started looking into this. So endorphins are the, there's a bunch of them, um, and they are you know, classed together and categorized as endorphins. They are chemicals which are uh, often also called um, your endogenous opioids. So in most of the different um, chemicals that are made inside you, which are called endogenous. So often if you hear the word endo something, it means that the thing was created inside you. So most of them were actually discovered by looking at the effects that drugs have on us. And so dopamine, for instance, was found by looking at how does cocaine work? And so uh, endocannabinoids, which we'll talk about next, were found by asking the question, how does cannabis work? And so the endorphins were found by asking the question, how does morphine work or how do opioids work? And so it turns out that we have a bunch of um, natural opioids called endorphins inside us that are actually way more powerful than even the strongest um, exogenous, the, the strongest external type that we could take in, your, your heroin, your whatever, even stronger than fentanyl, although <laughs> not life-earning, <laughs> thankfully. Um, so we have incredibly strong painkilling, bliss-inducing, euphoria-inducing, uh, chemicals and you know some of them have different qualities and I'd like to do a whole episode where we just get into it it's a fascinating subject but bottom line because we have a load to cover is that they can help with pain in two ways or to put it differently they can contribute to and maybe even cause a pain problem in two ways so first of all endorphins obviously are your body's natural painkillers and so some people have less of those than others and some people have less at some time than others a great example of this that all women are familiar with even though they may not know that that's the cause is that women's hormones go down at a certain time of the month but actually so do their level of endorphins so this is why women you know at a certain time of the month are much more likely to be sensitive to pain to feel pain and to also be more sensitive emotionally in general, if I'm still allowed to say that without being cancelled. Um, <laughs> and I can say that, look, as someone who's ended up having low endorphins and kind of acting like a woman <laughs> does a, month, a week or two of the month all the time. I was like constantly hypersensitive and, and like upset easily and all the rest of it. And I eventually discovered that the, one of the main reasons for that is because my own level of endorphins had become low and uh you know i, I came across this from a uh, um, an author i need to put the link to the book chrissy remind me uh it's it was only a chapter in the book but it was really good and she was talking about how often this is a, a misunderstanding between men and women how men tend to have higher levels of endorphins and so therefore they tend to be less compassionate and they tend to be more oh what's your problem kind of thing and this really upsets women who feel that like they're insensitive and and all the rest of it which is true um and so there's up there's kind of upsides and downsides to both is what i'm saying right so the upside to having a lot of endorphins is you don't feel a lot of pain but the downside to having a lot of endorphins is you don't feel a lot of pain and pain is actually a fantastic thing in many ways it's it gives us compassion it helps us to be present it helps us to have perspective uh, it helps us to have empathy and so a lot of the time, if you see someone acting like a boorish idiot, you know, who's like insensitive to others' feelings, you're dealing with someone who has high levels of endorphins. There's loads of other factors, but it's a factor, right? And so um, when, when you have those high levels of endorphins, uh, now you could have them naturally, but you could also have them as kind of a, a response. And so people who learn to disassociate uh, early in life, maybe because of traumatic experiences, the whole dorsal vagal system that we talked about a few episodes ago relates to this as well, having endorphins too high. And then you're in a situation where you're not really present, you're not aware of your feelings, you're not aware of other people's feelings, you're just in this kind of haze, similar to what would be created, you know, if you were taking narcotics, just maybe low levels, but, you know, like if you're constantly taking opioids, 
you would also be unaware of your own pain, unaware of other people's pain, insensitive, checked out, not present, disassociated, and all the rest of it, right? So it, it, endorphins are a tricky thing. You don't just want them to be high. But obviously, if you're on the end of the spectrum of having chronic pain, they're probably low. Now, they may be low for genetic reasons. I was just going to ask what would cause the endorphins to be low. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few different things. And I probably don't know all the answers in this regard. So one of the reasons is genetic, right? Some people absolutely have them lower than others. Another reason is situational. We talked about, you know, uh, a female menstrual cycle, for instance. Uh, another issue, and this is more where I get into other speculation, but I'm not just making this up. I, I got this from, you know, reading doctors and scientists, like theorizing about this. How if a person uh, learns to disassociate a lot in early life and they learn that as a strategy, that's something that they'll keep doing as long as they can. But eventually, so endorphins are one of those brain chemicals, just like dopamine and unlike oxytocin, that your body is constantly trying to keep at a certain level. It's constantly down-regulating. So... We all, with few exceptions, all want to feel like motivated and energized and excited and enthusiastic, right? So we, we want high dopamine, but the body's constantly going, no, 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 no. You can't be feeling that way all the time, right? It uses up too much energy for a start, right? You need to rest, you need to chill. So it's constantly trying to bring that dopamine back down. We bring it up with substances and we bring it up with activities and we bring it up with mindsets and the body keeps trying to downregulate. And this is why dopamine is so addictive. Well, you know what else is extremely addictive? opiates mm. and for the same reason the body is constantly down trying to down regulate it it doesn't seem to want us to constantly be in this now this is complicated because there's more than one endorphin <sighs> so it doesn't seem to want us to be in this check tower state all the time let's put it that way there is some evidence to be made that it actually is happy for us to be in a blissful happy state most of the time, hmm. there's some evidence for that. And this is what all the spiritual teachers for our history have always told us, you know, with, if you accept God into your heart, if you meditate hours a day, whatever it might be, right, then you can be in this enlightened state where you can basically be blissful most of the time. There is evidence for that. So there, is, there seems to be, and this is complicated, there's a bunch of different endorphins and there's also a bunch of different receptor sites for endorphins. And so this is new science. This is still being investigated. But there seems to be a type of high endorphins that's like really, really positive and makes you kind of spiritual and enlightened. And there seems to be a type of high endorphins that's not great and makes you checked out and disassociated and lacking in empathy and all the rest of it. So so this, this is still something that's being um, uh, investigated. But anyway, for all of us, except for the truly enlightened, it seems like the body is constantly trying to downregulate endorphins to be at a certain level. And so... When we have this kind of mental habit of constantly disassociating, that's using up endorphins. Now, also, of course, when we constantly keep doing activities which use endorphins, there is some evidence, and again, this is complicated and tricky, but there's some evidence that's actually going to deplete endorphins. So people, so exercise is good, but people exercise three or four hours a day. They're the ones who are kind of addicted to it. And maybe the reason that they keep doing it and they can't stop themselves even when they're starting to damage themselves is because they need the endorphin high because without it, they're actually feeling endorphin low, right? Like they've used up too much of it. This is again, theory, speculation. This is all fairly new, you know, investigation. Um, so, and then obviously there's the obvious reason why you might end up low in endorphins because you've be, been abusing any kind of opiate-like substance. That will absolutely do it. So any kind of opiate, what it does no, no drug makes you feel anything directly. All it ever does is stimulate the release of something that's already inside you that's going to make you feel something. Maybe there's an exception to that I'm not thinking of. But anyway, that's the rule, even if there's exceptions. So and it's, it's the case with opiates, right? So it's going in there. It's, it's uh, stimulating the release of your own endorphins. You have less. This is why, apparently, I've not done it. The first time you take heroin, it's the best you ever feel in your life because it floods you with so many endorphins. The second time you take it, it's still good, but a little bit less. And then after not that long, after a press, depressingly short period of time, you're no longer taking it to feel high or to feel bliss or to feel good. You're taking it just to not be in pain. And why are you in a situation where you're constantly in pain unless you're taking drugs? 
because you've used up your endorphins. See, it turns out if you were to take a magic, uh, take a human body, wave a magic wand over it, which magically removed all the endorphins, that person would collapse into agony. Like the only thing that's stopping us being in agony all the time is the endorphins that we have, wow. right? And so when you deplete those endorphins through anything, as I said, the exercise thing is speculative, but certainly the drug use thing is not. Um, and, and there's a bunch of other things that stimulate endorphins. Um, so basically any, we talked about the adrenals a lot in the uh, stress episode. Peak stress and arguably, and again, there's more research needed into this, even the dorsal type of stress is using up endorphins because your body thinks, oh, emergency. So in an emergency, not only do we have to mobilize all the energy to run away or attack the threat, but also we can't afford, if we're fighting a tiger or running away from a tiger, to be aware, to be distracted by a pain in our leg. So it also floods our body with endorphins so we don't feel any pain temporarily because then we're more able to fight and more able to run. It's like, you know, funnily enough, in terms of archetypes, the archetype that I really associate with endorphins, even though it's the the feeling of bliss and euphoria and all the rest of it, which you might think belongs to like, you know, your spiritual teacher or whatever, I see it as the archetype of the warrior. Like the warrior is the one that's really addicted to endorphins, you know, like the the Viking kind of mentality, right? Like we're going to fight and we're going to go to Valhalla. Probably the reason <laughs> that they believe that you only go to heaven if you die in the middle of fighting is because when you're in the middle of fighting, yes, you're flooded with adrenaline, but you're also flooded with endorphins. You feel like you know, spiritually connected in some weird way, you know? So it's not a surprise that they had that belief. And who knows, it may be true. I'm no expert <laughs> in what happens after you die. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, so th there's a lot to this whole endorphin thing. Now, I know we've got tons of other, other things to cover. I, I was really into this a while ago, and then I kind of ran out of things to learn about, like resources for this. And then recently, half a year ago, something I came across something new, and it blew my mind, it's fantastic. And so I'll just point people to it. And it's low dose naltrexone. And so, as I said, the biggest issue with endorphins is that any drug you take that stimulates it will deplete you of it even more. It's that tolerance issue that's worse than tolerance. It's, as I said, you soon, you know, before long you end up in pain unless you take them. Um, and then um, even potentially activities that stimulate endorphin, like adrenal activities, which is what they usually are, um, tend to deplete them. Now, does medit meditation stimulate endorphins? Cold, does that deplete endorphins? I don't think so. I think, but th again, this is only speculation. I think because you're also stimulating a lot of those calming chemicals, like oxytocin and GABA and stuff like that, I don't think it does in deplete endorphins in the same way, but I don't know. That hasn't been proven either way. Um, but certainly, you know, a lot of the intense activities that are generally draining of energy, it seems that they are also draining of endorphins. So how do you get your endorphins back up? If this resonates with you, if you feel like this might be the problem for you or one of the problems, naltrexone is the best answer I can give you. Low dose naltrexone. So, and again, this is a drug. This is something you need to get from a doctor. But there are plenty of them out there that will prescribe this for you. They, what? it does is it actually does the opposite of a drug. So if you take a, a, an opium or a heroin or a morphine, it will go in there and stimulate endorphin release. What naltrexone actually does is it blocks the receptors that the endorphins would go into, meaning you actually have less endorphins in your system temporarily. Now, why would that be a good thing if low endorphins is your problem? The reason is because it has exactly the opposite effect. By blocking the endorphin receptor, it actually, your body has the opposite response. Remember I said it's always down-regulating endorphins? Well, it's actually also up-regulating if it feels like they're too low. And so it's by blocking those endorphin receptors, the body goes, oh, wait a minute, there's not enough endorphins to get the result we need, which is you know this average level of uh, endorphin activity. So we need to create more endorphins and we need to create more receptors for the endorphins. So this is the theory behind it. Low dose naltrexone. There's a huge body of research around it. There's you know uh, teams of doctors and scientists looking into it. I'll, uh, again, remind me, Chrissy, let's make sure to put a, a link to the LDN Society, um, which you know has published several books on the subject, and there's loads of scholarly articles by um, all kinds of doctors in all kinds of fields. It's really interesting. Now. 
so far, I've just talked about endorphins in terms of pain, but I've got to mention one other thing, and this is the thing that was new to me when I found out about naltrexone, which is that endorphins, not only are they thing in charge of making you feel good, making you feel blissful, making you feel perhaps spiritually connected, and certainly, yes, yeah, free of pain, they also are in charge of keeping the immune system balanced. So there's the answer to that question that you asked before, and that question that I've been asking myself for at least the last you know, several years, what is it that causes an immune system to go out of balance? And I had a million answers, right? People blame vegetable oil, they blame lack of exercise, <laughs> they blame this, that, and the other. There's a million answers. But I'm always trying to look to like, what's the core thing? What's the core thing? Why is it that some people who have vegetable oil don't have chronic inflammation issues? You know, like what's, what's the root of it? And it turns out that endorphins might be one of the key answers, if not the most important answers. Like, so endorphins regulate the immune system. They make it so it functions better and they make it so there is a right balance between the kind of attacking elements of the immune system and then the regulating aspects of the immune system that don't encourage that over attacking, which may lead to autoimmune situations. Um, and so low dose LT LDN is actually given more often to help people with autoimmunity than it is given to help people with pain. That's the main thing that it's used for all kinds of different autoimmune conditions. It's also used for different psychological conditions, people with PTSD, people with disassociative disorders. Um, again, with the disassociative disorders, you use it slightly differently than every other way. So with other issues, you tend to have it at night so that your endorphin receptors are blocked while you're asleep, so it doesn't really bother you. And then by the time you wake up, they'll have been invigorated and maybe your body will have grown a few more. But with a disassociation, you'd actually have it first thing in the morning and throughout the day because it blocks the endorphin receptors, which makes you more present. So, and less able to dissociate. So again, I know people very close to me who've had fantastic results with that, where lifelong habit of disassociating, all the spiritual practice, psychotherapy, you know, everything, nothing has really helped because that temptation to disassociate is so strong. And so it's so easy to do, you know, as soon as life gets too difficult, just check out, right? It's totally understandable when people have had severe trauma, if it was the only thing that worked for them, and then it becomes a neural habit, which is very hard to undo. But low dose LDN can literally stop you being able to do that. Um, and so therefore you can be more present, and ironically, you might think, well, in that case, okay, that's great. You're more present, but you're also in more pain. It seems like often no. So they don't quite understand why that's the case, why it would actually mean that you also have less physical pain that's still being investigated. But anyway, um, that's really the best thing I can recommend when it comes to endorphins because all the usual advice they give, you know, laugh more, exercise more, uh, meditate more is the only one, as I said, that I don't feel is at all suspect that is just seems to be there's a lot of research showing that's just beneficial but still i don't know how much it's unless you're really dedicated to it like you know spiritual practice is your full-time you know your number one priority um it doesn't seem to be enough to undo that tendency for endorphin dysfunction low dose ldn really seems to be the quick fix way and everyone's always looking for the quick fix so that's the quickest fix i know we're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. 
That's quite, <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah, I was gonna say because you know, <laughs> if, if somebody can't, you know, let's say they they're not able to get the the um, low dose naltrexone, you know, what um when you know, what else would they be able to do really? The only other thing that I have come across, and again, comments, leave me some if you know about the stuff that really works, is to give your body more of the building blocks for some of the key endorphins, and the building blocks are basically. Um, amino acids again, going back to that conversation that we had of peptides. Uh, a lot of the endorphins are in fact just peptides, although again, not a good idea to take them in exogenously because then your body will just make less. Mm. Um, but that's what they are. And uh, so giving your body the basic building blocks can help. And so methionine and phenylalanine are the two, uh, phenylalanine, sorry, are the two amino acids that your body makes peptides out of, uh, uh, the uh, endorphin peptides out of. But the thing that's been found is a particular form called DLPA, um, or sometimes even just DPA. So there's kind of there's two forms of amino acids: there's the D form and the L form. For some reason, the D form of uh, phenylalanine is the one that is the most helpful. And so, quite often, people will take that empty stomach, 500 milligram, 1,000 milligrams a day, something like that. Um, for a few weeks, months, and they may well notice that their pain goes down. Um, sometimes incrementally, sometimes considerably, all depends on what's causing your issue, of course. But uh, if it is a lack of that building block, which it could be, because as we talked about in previous episodes, uh, a deficiency in amino acids is a real problem, especially as you get older and older. So that could be one reason why you're low in endorphins as well. And so if that's the case, then it can help. And even if it's not the case, if you just give your body an abundance of the building blocks, sometimes for whatever reason, it starts creating more of the stuff. So <laughs> maybe that's placebo. No, that's really great. Thank you. You mentioned and we were going to touch on endocannabinoids next. Do you want to take that one away for us? Yes. So endocannabinoids is, again, one that I had a misconception about. So I thought that the reason why things like CBD and THC would reduce pain is because for a kind of similar mechanism, they're just numbing you. But it turns out, just as in the case of endorphins, that's not actually true. So there are a bunch of CB uh, cannabis receptors in your body. This is all fairly recent, the last few decades that this has really been you know, understood and expanded upon. But you have CB1 receptors and you have CB2 receptors. CB2 receptors are, CB1 are more to do with the nervous system, more to do with how you feel. But the CB2 receptors are to do with the immune system. And so there's a lot to it, but I'm obviously boiling it down for sake of brevity. So um, by activating those CB2 receptors, it can absolutely help to reduce inflammation significantly. And this is why so many people absolutely swear by CBD to help to uh, reduce pain. It's not just that it helps to reduce the perception of pain, although it also does that. So just to explain a little bit more, so what's been found so far is endorphins have this, you know, as I say, kind of, good and bad side but bottom line is they kind of help you to be more aware of i don't know a spiritual plane rather than a material one which can be a bad thing if it's a disassociation it can be a good thing if it is uh you know more spiritual connection so cannabinoids are the other main compound or everyday compound i guess dmt is an exception but they're the other everyday compound which really relates to spiritual connection you could say oxytocin as well but oxytocin is more that heart connection it's more your connection to other people nature the world yourself whatever but you know it's more of a like an up there connection is your endorphins and endocannabinoids so endocannabinoids one of the ways that they give you a spiritual connection is they just help you to take life and especially yourself a little bit less seriously <laughs> and so this is a thing, again, that some people struggle with, myself included. And sure enough, we don't have the report available anymore, unfortunately. But back when we did, um, my endocannabinoid report, I'm low in endocannabinoids. So I have a tendency. And so this can create a few different uh, effects. One of them is that the immune system tends to get more dysregulated because other than endorphins, the other thing that really regulates it, it seems, is the endocannabinoid system. Um, and so one of the things that I'm more likely to have inflammation in general Another thing is I'm more likely to take myself too seriously. Another thing is I tend to have a reduced appetite. Um, and I tend to be, you know, like run more like stressed, you know, like type A kind of thing. There are some people who have the opposite. They actually have high levels of natural endocannabinoids. They tend to be more hungry, more likely to be overweight, but more likely to be content with life, more likely to not take themselves too seriously. Mm. 
more likely to you know have this connection with nature maybe um just easy going right so if i were to sum up in one word low endocannabinoids uptight high endocannabinoids <laughs> easy going but you know you could put it the other way low endocannabinoids motivated driven high endocannabinoids uh, complacent right so when you remove the judgment for it it's it's just different, right? Everyone's different. But anyway, the bad thing about having low endocannabinoids as well is that you have more of a tendency for this inflammatory issue. I wish there was something like low-dose naltrexone for endocannabinoids. There doesn't seem to be. The best thing I've found to raise it naturally in a sustainable way, again, is meditation. It can be raised um, temporarily in very similar ways to endorphins. So laughing will raise it. Uh, cold water, uh, sauna, exercise, all of those kind of um, temporary but healthy shocks to the system can uh, raise it temporarily. But And again, more research needs to be done. But the only thing that seems to uh, make an effect, and again, there's not enough research on this, but the only thing that seems to be able to raise it kind of on a more permanent basis is like deep meditation. I'd love to hear about other stuff. If you know, again, not theories, but you know, proven research-based things, that would be great. But I'd love that if there was something like low-dose naltrexone that actually blocked the receptor to force your body to make more receptors and more endocannabinoids. I have not heard of that yet. The closest that we have currently is CBD. So CBD, it doesn't actually, um, it's not an agonist. It doesn't actually activate the CB1 and CB2 receptors. It works through some other kind of nebulous way that science doesn't actually quite understand yet, as far as I've been able to uh, see in my own research. Um, so it, it kind of helps to regulate the level of endocannabinoids you have without stimulating the receptors, which could lead to that down regulation. So that's probably the best we've got. And that's why CBD is non-habit forming and stuff like that. CBD can be really helpful for pain. And so when you're talking with CBD, because there's also the THC component, is that separate from or together or? They're separate. So right. C THC is a strong CB1 and to some degree CB2 agonist or stimulator. So it absolutely will uh, release your own endocannabinoids into your system, floods them into your system, to which your body will then downregulate its own production, to which... This is why, and people, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but this is why, you know, cannabis, high THC cannabis is habit forming for many people. Uh, I used it a lot in my teens and 20s. And I can tell you when I stopped, did I have the kind of withdrawal that an alcoholic has or a heroin addict? No. But what I did experience is that without it, life seemed very, very, very dull, mm. you know, um, and like painfully boring. And so this is one of the the challenges. And this is one of the criticisms of cannabis as well is, uh, I can't remember who I heard this from, but they said, you know, the problem with cannabis, you know, from a societal or, or a personal development point of view is it makes you feel okay with being bored. It makes you feel okay with not doing anything meaningful and significant, right? Like, and this is a true, you know, this is the problem with cocaine or amphetamine or whatever is it makes you feel like you're achieving something when you're not, you know? Like, so that's, so it, yeah, it has a drug-like effect. Is it also, does it have medicinal value? Yes. So does morphine, right? So does cocaine. They used, doctors used to hand it out like candy a hundred years ago for medicinal reasons. Like every drug can have some medicinal value in some context, some situations with some people. But um, is it a great long-term strategy to have high levels of endogenous cannabinoids? No. Um, and so the good thing about CBD is it does cancel out the negative effects of THC to some degree. And so if you want to if you want to use THC or if you're going to use it, no matter what I say, I would say just make the ratio of CBD to THC as high as you can, right? If you're used to having, you know, a hugely strong THC cannabis with barely any CBD, try adding a load of CBD. If you're used to having like similar amounts of each, just try having more CBD in ratio to THC, like. The more you increase that CBD in ratio to THC, the better. CBD doesn't have the psychoactive effect, but you know this is an episode about pain, and it absolutely does help with pain. The only way that THC really helps with pain that I understand is more in the line of what we talked about, where it just makes you disassociate, right? You're so caught up in your thoughts and your, your insights and your perceptions that you forget about the pain. Whereas CBD really does seem to be more effective at actually hitting that CB2 uh, receptor, although indirectly, like I said, so it doesn't kind of um, 
down regulate and just helping to reduce inflammation not just your perception of inflammation but actual inflammation does seem to go down with cbd but as i said it's not perfect i would much prefer like a low dose naltrexone that helped you produce more of your own but it's the best we seem to have for now yeah that would be uh the best is you know getting the body to do what the body does in the most optimal way you did mention alcohol does alcohol work on the endocannabinoid system or does it work on a different system you know? uh, to some degree, it works on a few different things. It's dopamine, it's GABA. GABA is actually the main thing that it increases, which is one of the reasons people like it so much. It you know, just shuts down the part of us that, again, is overthinking, does take ourselves too seriously, is too uptight, all that kind of thing. Um, but I, my understanding is it does that, so I can see why you asked the question, but my understanding is it does that more by raising GABA rather than raising endocannabinoids, although it probably does to some small degree. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, I didn't want to detract, so I'm sure that you've got a few more on the list to get through. What's next, Owen? Yeah, so I'll probably run through these quicker because these ones I spent more time on because I'm introducing them. We haven't talked about it up until now in this series, um, but thyroid, right? Thyroid is absolutely key. Now, funnily enough, you know, I've already been open that thyroid is like the main, actually the only medical condition that I have that, you know, any doctor would recognize. Um, and so, and even then, it depends on the doctor and the country as to whether <laughs> I'm considered bad enough to be uh, considered a medical condition. But um, thyroid is actually how I, uh, sorry, pain is actually how I came across thyroid. So it was while investigating pain that I came across this concept that um, it actually, so uh, a person, a body actually requires energy to relax. This is an interesting concept. And so um, the, the example that was given to me about this is that when a person dies, do they kind of go all flaccid and like a jelly? No, they go into rigor mortis, right? They do the opposite. They actually contract and become tight. And it's only as things literally start to rot and like proteins are breaking down and stuff that eventually that will like diminish. But basically the, the person literally has to like, the tissues have to fall apart. They don't ever relax. They just kind of, you know, disintegrate basically. Um, and so it takes energy to relax. That's the point. Where does energy come from? That's obviously not a simple question, but as we've talked about in the hormone episode, one of the main, well, the main accelerator or break as to how much energy every mitochondria in every cell is producing for you is thyroid hormone. And so when you are low in thyroid hormone, you are much more likely to have chronic pain conditions. Are there a bunch of people who all they have to do is increase their thyroid hormone? because their thyroid hormone is too low and then it resolves their pain issues? Absolutely. Do they sometimes have to do other stuff, which we're gonna talk about next? Um, yes, but it's, uh, it can be as simple as that. And again, this is one of those things that if you have hypothyroidism, you can do everything else that I recommend or that other people recommend it, and it might be why it still comes back, right? So it's one of those, could be the weakest link. It's one of those things that if you have it, you have to address it, otherwise, you just might not get better. In fact, you probably won't if you have a real issue. Uh, next one, thymus. So we talked about this a lot again in the last couple of episodes, um, but basically, yeah, I think we covered it. So I'll just remind you, um, if you have a lack of thymus peptides that regulate your immune system, that could mean you're in a constantly inflammatory state, right? And for more info on that, check out the peptides episode. Uh, cortisol. So we didn't um, go into a lot of detail about that. I want to do episode soon. Remind me, cortisol and thyroid. I think we need to get into that. Yeah, cort we'll do those cortisol together. is definitely a, a big one. It's yeah, I'd like to definitely go into that for an episode. Yeah, so come on, tell us all awesome. about cortisol. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that show, um, you know when they give you steroids for pain, like steroid creams usually and stuff like that. They're not giving you anabolic steroids, right? They're not giving you testosterone. What they're giving you is cortisone. So cortisone is basically cortisol. So basically when they say, that's the, in fact, you know, we didn't talk about that type of painkiller. So we talked about uh, opioids. We talked about non-steroid or anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and, uh, and uh, paracetamol. But what about steroidal ones? So it turns out cortisol, which is your body's main stress hormone, is an anti-inflammatory. And so one of the reasons why a person could have chronic inflammation actually could be because they have too low cortisol. Now, this is a big topic because, and this is why I want to do it in a whole episode, because 
we hear a lot about cortisol these days, but all we ever hear about is too much cortisol. That is an issue often. Um, but among people, especially people who um, maybe have low blood pressure rather than high blood pressure, who tend to be underweight rather than overweight, who tend to run cold rather than hot. Um, and yeah, those are really the distinctions. Other than that, it's, there's a lot of similarity between lo low cortisol and high cortisol. A person with high cortisol tends to be quite stressed and anxious. A person with low cortisol tends to be quite stressed and anxious. <laughs> there's actually and all the things that come with that. So there's a lot of overlap. And so this is a thing you don't want to guess what, what you are or, or base it on, um, you know, like some self assessment quiz or something like that, because the symptoms are too similar, despite what I just said, because there could be other reasons why, um, you know, you run cold run hot and all the rest of it. You, you actually have to test this. And yes, we do uh, offer a genetic test for a tendency to run higher, lower cortisol or in between. But again, that's not good enough either. You can actually get not a blood test, a saliva test you do four times throughout the day. That's the most reliable type, not the type of normal mainstream doctor will offer you, but the type that all those who've actually researched, including a bunch of medical doctors, will tell you is the best type um, to find out what your level of cortisol is. If your cortisol is too high, that can lead to a lot of different problems, but chronic pain isn't really one of them. But if your cortisol is too low, which is quite common, then that can be a significant contributing factor. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, cold water these days or cold therapy, cryotherapy is really catching on as like a health thing, rightly so. And one of the things that it does is it stimulates cortisol, it raises cortisol, it elevates cortisol. And doing that will knock back inflammation considerably. And that's why if you do like a cold bath or cold shower, you know, once or twice a day, you keep spiking that cortisol, it can keep knocking back that inflammation. And over time, it can have a really powerful effect on chronic inflammation. So this is why some people with chronic pain absolutely do benefit from cold treatments. Not everyone, so <laughs> this is my theorizing. I have not uh, come across the research for this, but I would speculate those who run high on cortisol, uh, stimulating even more cortisol doesn't really help. In fact, it can make things worse because one of the problems with having too high cortisol or too low cortisol is that Either way, not enough thyroid hormone is getting from the blood into the cells where it's actually needed. And so having the balance level of cortisol is key. So again, it's really important to find out what your level of cortisol is, not just for like what stuff you take or whatever, but also for what activities you do. If you're already running a high on cortisol, should you be like having a type A lifestyle and then to rest, you know, do like intense hot sauna and intense cold this and intense exercise. No, it's just going to spike cortisol more and more. That would be my supposition. Whereas on the other hand, you know, if your cortisol is really low, should you be like constantly avoiding any stressful situation and then, you know, uh, resting and relaxing and meditating and all the rest of it? Maybe no, right? Maybe what you need to do is some intense exercise, some cold, some, you know, some, some intense activity. So it's really, really important to find out what your level of cortisol is. Cortisol is one of our primary anti-inflammatories in the moment, the proof of which being that doctors will often hand it to you if you have an inflammatory issue. So of course it is effective. Yeah, which brings me to you know a comment question in this regard too, is for a lot of people that do have certain issues with in their joints or in their back or things like that, they'll get a, a cortisone shot or something like that. And like, yeah, I feel mm -hmm. amazing now, I feel great. But it hasn't yep. addressed the underlying issue, correct? It's just masking or mm -hmm. giving them some relief from the pain. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think it's such an issue of down regulation, like your body will start making less cortisol because it, it, yeah, it takes a lot for your body to make less cortisol. There's this theory that's common that like what happens with cortisol is that initially it's high and then eventually it ends up being low. Again, high and low compared to optimal, not compared to what medical doctors are going to consider an issue. Um, I'm not so sure about that. What I see is that the I feel like it's more of like a neurological habit to either run high cortisol or run low cortisol. And yes, it is true. If people push themselves too hard and they burn out, then eventually high can crash and turn into low. But mine's high. I bet it's been high for decades, you know, and maybe it will continue to be high for decades as long as I uh, don't completely crash and burn. And then there are some people I know, I bet it's been low for decades. So I think, I think there's definitely a neurological habit aspect to that. I'm sure there's a genetic predisposition aspect to it as well, because you know we do reports that indicate that. My genetic predisposition is for the cortisol to be high. 
Um, but I see other people where I see they have that tendency even with our genetics. I think, as I said, then it's more of a neurological habit. Like it's hardwired for them to drive themselves in that way and to stimulate that in themselves. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, but the kind of person that I noticed that tends to suffer from chronic pain is actually not the kind of person like me. It is more the type that um, tends to be a little bit cold, tends to be a little bit overweight, tends to be a little bit low energy, a little bit low drive. And um, not always, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's a type A person who's collapsed, but often it's the other type. And so um, I feel like that low cortisol is a significant factor. Now, of course, we talked about endorphins and endocannabinoids earlier. These are master regulators kind of of everything, right? So whether your cortisol is too high or too low, I would speculate, this is why I've done this presentation in this order. If you get those master regulators in a good place first, that it is possible that these things start to sort themselves out more. As you and I have talked about privately, Chrissy, I feel like a lot of time to sort out cortisol, you actually need to sort out thyroid mm. because um, a lot of the time when people have high cortisol, it's because they're, and in fact low, it's because their thyroid is not optimal. But then it's catch-22 because once your, fire, once your uh, cortisol is not optimal, then it's hard for your thyroid to be optimal. So it's hard, it's chicken and egg, it's hard to know what comes first. And that's why I said, I think we should do a whole episode on it. Um, the last two I'll just briefly mention, testosterone. So as I said, uh, it's not anabolic steroids they give you when you're in pain, um, but actually they could do. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the, the reason why the people who do use steroid steroids, right? The bodybuilder guys and the athletes and stuff like that. One of the reasons why they're able to train so intensely um, and not hurt themselves as much and not be exhausted and not be, well, not be exhausted, not be in pain like us average non-steroid using hormones people would is because they're on steroids. So anabolic steroids, testosterone also does reduce pain. It, as Andrew Huberman says, it makes effort and exertion pleasurable. Um, and it absolutely helps with recovery and all the rest of it as well. Am I saying you should take steroids, anabolic steroids? No, but I am saying, so if that's the case for the extreme, which is anabolic steroid use, then think about even within the normal range, you're going to have less chronic pain if you have high end of optimal testosterone than if you have low testosterone as a man. So it's still a significant factor, all other things being equal. Not as significant as all the rest, which is why I put it at this part of the list, but still something, especially for men. I don't think women, unfortunately, have equivalents to that. Women often um, also end up low in testosterone by the time they're in their 40s and beyond. So women also often benefit from adding some testosterone but they would not generally add enough that it would make that difference. So this is more of a man thing. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, serotonin and melatonin and dopamine as well to some degree, the neurotransmitters uh, are important as well. So, and this is be, you know, because they have an impact on stress. Well, let's do one thing at a time. So dopamine, you might've noticed when you're really, really focused and like in the middle of something, you're not aware that you're in pain. Mm -hmm. So that's dopamine. So dopamine does not resolve chronic pain, but it does in the moment uh, reduce and sometimes even remove the perception of pain. So dopamine is a factor. And those who genetically are predisposed to run lower dopamine or those who have overdone it with dopamine and depleted themselves are more likely to have chronic pain. So that's an issue. Um, it's not like do increasing dopamine will resolve the issue, but it's more that um, depleting yourself of dopamine may have contributed to the issue. Melatonin is an issue in the sense of uh, obviously sleep. If you do not get enough sleep, if you do not get enough deep sleep, then that absolutely will make pain issues worse through the impact that it has on stress, through the impact that it has in the immune system functioning properly, inflammation, all that stuff. You probably heard that before. Sleep has been really big in the last five years or so. Everyone's suddenly becoming aware of how important it is for health and for everything. Uh, and then lastly, serotonin. Um, so serotonin is the chemical that makes you feel relaxed and calm and confident. Wonderful. Wonderful. I just had another thought that or a question that popped up in because migraines can be super, super debilitating. Can you uh, shed some light on, on migraines and, and, and the pain that comes with that and why it's so debilitating and where they might come from? Yeah, there's a few different causes for them. I think, again, in mainstream science, this is not like settled science by any means. Um, there are a few different factors. Um, I would say the thing we're going to talk about next is a big one. Okay. But I know where you brought it up. It can also be serotonin. It absolutely can be uh, a serotonin deficiency 
um, why you have digestive pain and why you have uh, headaches and migraines as well. And I realized they're not the same headaches and migraines, but yeah, they can both relate to uh, a deficiency in serotonin. But I feel it's more because the thing we're about to get into. So we'll get into that. Beautiful. Yeah. Lead in. Yeah. Is there a connection <laughs> between stress and chronic pain? What, you know, I have, yeah, is there? Definitely a leading question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I've kind of danced around this um, a little bit. Obviously, we talked about cortisol and various things, but let's, that's all kind of chemistry. A lot of people don't find that very really relatable. Let's talk about our actual experience, right? You and me as people who maybe suffer from chronic pain or know people who do. So let's assume that the person listening has it. Have you seen that connection between the more stressed I am, the more in pain I am? And the answer might be it depends, right? Because if the stress is really acute, actually the pain might go down because the cortisol shoots up, which is an anti-inflammatory, right? And uh, so it's not always that simple. However, in general, that prolonged chronic stress, so you know, you've got some issue, you got some issue with your boss at work, you feel like you, know, you might be getting fired, you got some issue in your relationship, anything like that that is just um, going on and on rather than a quick spike followed by a resolution, that's more the kind of stress I'm talking about, that um, a chronic high stress. Have you noticed a correlation between that and pain? I absolutely have. And when I talk to people, um, they generally have as well, right? So why is that so there's a few different things you know reasons for that part of it could be due to all the chemistry stuff we just talked about right so stress will raise cortisol temporarily it will reduce testosterone it will reduce serotonin it will reduce thymus uh, peptide activity um it will reduce um thyroid by messing with the cortisol and yeah, it will even affect uh, levels of endorphin, like we talked about. Acute stress raises endorphin, but chronic stress will actually deplete endorphins. Uh, acute stress will raise endocannabinoids, but chronic stress will deplete endocannabinoids. So we've kind of really talked about all the chemistry of it, but what about our actual experience? And what about on a brain level? So here's the thing I think that's important to understand. It's going back to what I started with. So pain is a signal or should be a signal, remember I corrected myself then as I'm doing now, pain should be a signal that there's something wrong, but sometimes it's not. So here's the challenge with chronic pain. If you have pain, you feel like there's something wrong. This is understandable, right? But the problem is the feeling like there's something wrong will uh, continue the stress response that might otherwise, as we said, go acute and then calm down again. The feeling like there's something wrong will continue the stress response and make the stress chronic. And then the fact of chronic stress will keep the pain going through its impact on the thyroid and the thymus and all the things that we've just been talking about, right? So it's this vicious circle again, this feedback loop where a feeling that something is wrong because I'm in pain it keeps that chronic stress going. And then that chronic stress going keeps the chronic pain going. And so it's really important to become aware of that um, and then actually break that feedback loop. Now, we've talked about a bunch of biochemical ways to break that loop. Um, but yeah, I also want to talk about the more experiential ways of doing it. And because this has been such a big revelation for me. Wonderful. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed everything that you heard in this part one of Chronic Pain. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss part two, where we're going to look at the underlying causes of chronic pain that are overlooked. See you next time. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, I want to tell you about a way that you can support the podcast while also getting great deals on high quality supplements that Ellen and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is that they have great quality products with minimal fillers at a very affordable price. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're very helpful and friendly. And the thing I love most of all is the amazing descriptions that Elwin has written about each product category on that topic. 
And each product has so much education on it that I've actually learned more from reading the descriptions than I have from a lot of articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, use promo code RejuvenateMe for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order using promo code RejuvenateMe at feelyounger.net.